we like to have a choice. Why? I mean, I don't have a simple answer. Ukrainian self-image is, is Macaulay Culkin in, in Home Alone. <laughs> that was a choice. Empire is bad. What next? When there is no Russia. Yeah. Good day, you are watching United24. I'm your host, Glib Buryak, and our new show, Face to Face. And we're gonna discuss empires, future and past of uh, global civilization, the role of Ukraine in our modern future, and the movies we want to see about that. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and feel free to drop comments on your opinion on that and people you want to see in our next shows. Today we have an honorable guest, Peter Pomerantsev, a writer, journalist, scholar of John Hopkins University and a great friend of Ukraine. Hello, Peter. We are glad to have you with us. I think it's nice to be here. I don't know yet. I don't know what's about to happen to me. All British people I know are great vocal supporters of Ukraine here in this war we are having. And uh, I have a question. Like, uh, half of the UN members, they celebrate Independence Day from Great Britain. Yeah. And now uh, you are supporting us, David, in this David and Goliath battle. What happened with the good old let's enslave the weak? Well, I suppose in order to compensate for our own history of subjugating other people, using hunger to break their societies and putting them in concentration camps. We've also liked to think of ourselves as the liberal empire. So from the 19th century, Russia was the authoritarian empire, where we were the liberal empire. So the British always saw themselves in a competition with Russia for territory in, in the Indian subcontinent but also ideologically. Read somebody like Oscar Wilde or, or many, many other writers in the 19th century, they'll always contrast the British model of empire and the Russian model of empire. And the Russians would do the same thing. So um, kind of competing and um, having proxy wars of Russia is kind of what we do. Yeah, well, that's, that's actually pretty, the thing pretty, I heard, yeah. that uh, Britons are pursuing the war that started long ago, especially I mean, in the Crimea with Balaklava and... Uh, well, yeah, or the great game in Afghanistan, that was another sort of competition. So, so it's a very, very normal instinct for our, for our foreign office, for our spies, to get into a bit of a tussle with Russia. Uh, you started saying about the difference between British Empire and uh, the Russian Empire, whatever Russians call that. Britain and uh, the ideology of the Western world are actually those goals, marks, Ukraine uh, wants to move forward to, mm -hmm. right? To, to get rid of the Soviet heritage. And uh, what are the basic differences and values that uh, not only Britain, the Western world, civilized Western world with humanitarian values, proclaims. So we all know the ones that we proclaim, but they've, you know, about rights and uh, democracy and the role of civil society and all these things. What's very powerful coming to Ukraine is the minute that you cross the border, these words like, these cliches. Here, not only do they gain meaning, but here they gain stories and existential meaning. People are literally fighting for democratic values and articulating it as such. It's not abstract. You know, you meet people from the villages near the front lines who've just elected their first status to their first sort of local parliaments and the village level. And they know when the Russians come, that won't exist anymore. And so they're literally fighting for that. People on the local level can articulate that they're fighting for what we call democratic values. I mean, I think you've, you've asked a, be a beautiful, and very powerful question, which is given that Ukraine and Russia were part of one empire or subsequent empires for so long, why did Russia choose to become authoritarian? And it chose to become authoritarian. I lived in Russia from 2001 to 2010, and the country, including the so-called liberal elites, consciously, aggressively chose, voted for, elected, selected, with a huge amount of intention, an authoritarian and then dictatorial future. That was a choice, a conscious desire. 
Putin was elected many times, was selected and constructed as a candidate who would appeal to the Russian demand for, dicta for dictatorship. While Ukrainians have come from the same tradition, same chaos in the 1990s, very similar Great. experience of post-Soviet economic trauma, and make the conscious choice again and again and again for democracy. We like to have a choice. Yes, so you're, you're, I mean, this is an incredible question, why? Why? I mean, I don't have a simple answer, but, but I, uh, between 2015 and 21, I did a huge amount of social research here, largely because my background's in television and, and media and, and journalism, I suppose. And we were thinking, how do we create a journalism and a media that is responsive to Ukrainian audiences? And so we were trying to understand people. And we we're trying to very much understand this. What is the democratic impulse and how do you work with it? Look, and part of it might be a post-colonial impulse. Part of it might be that in a culture where any type of regime was always colonial, whether it's Austro-Hungarian or Polish or Hungarian or Russian or Soviet, there's this sort of culture of seeing a gap between yourself and power right. and finding your ways of survival by avoiding power. And so one of the things we looked at was how is corruption different in Ukraine and in Russia? And in Russia, corruption seems to be more about that's how you join the system. You pay your way into the yeah, system. Yeah, it's like institutionalized, it's predictable, it has rules. But also you do it to join the system. While in Ukraine, you do it to get the system off your back. You're just like, here's your bribe, Mostly go away. Yes. In Russia, that, that tradition of success means joining the state. Progress means joining the state. And this idea that the state is important and the centralized state is important. Well, Ukraine, because it always saw itself as colonized in various ways, that instinct was already there to cast off foreign power or your own power. I think there's a something else that we, we found a lot was because the state and institutions are always a threat, people rely on horizontal connections. Yeah. So whether that's, I mean, it's what we call civil society in, 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 in Europe and America. In America, there's a huge belief, there's a huge similarity between Ukraine and America this way, yeah? The idea that the, the state is always from the empire and true, so, true society, civil society, actually very, very similar. This reliance on horizontal connections, this belief in them, so whether that's, and again, a bit like America, that can mean the church, that can mean family and friends, it can mean mafia. Mafia is also a form of civil society in this sense. True. So there's that. And it was very interesting. We, we tested different films that worked with Ukrainians. And one of the themes that always worked with Ukrainians was the little guys working together against the big guys. So the classic, you know, hobbits working against Sauron thing. But what was very interesting, so remember we did a, we, we tested with different audiences across the country, a film that was made by Ukrainians, which was about sort of Jews and Tatars two small minorities working together during the Nazi occupation and the Soviet occupation, World War II and afterwards. So it's got two monstrous empires, Nazi yeah, and Soviet. Yeah, we that uh, Tatars uh, a Muslim society. Yeah, 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 Tatars are Muslim, Jews are yeah, not, obviously. Yeah, but, 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 but two minorities in Ukraine. And, and the story was how they all worked together to first push off the Nazis and, and then the Soviets, or survive. And that worked really well across the whole territory. That's the point. If you take Ukrainian uh, tales yeah. or literature, whatever, the, the idea of freedom mm. is uh, adamant in those yeah. tales. Like Taras Shevchenko, all his Kabzal verses were all about freedom yeah. or about the pain of being enslaved. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. there's that as well, there's that as well. well so. I grew up in the 90s. I went to school in the 90s. And uh, my main source of information and my image of the way life should be was uh, Western movies. Uh -huh. Yeah, starting with uh, action movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, but then getting back to Braveheart or Forrest Gump or anywhere where you have the idea of identity and fighting against some uh, huge institution. I actually felt this difference that some people, they supported uh, Wallace watching the movie in Braveheart. Like, uh -huh. But some people thought, well, come on, he's... Uh, yeah, he's ruining the state. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I heard people <laughs> claiming that, well, Brits are right. That's very funny. Yeah, because they bring order. Okay. Yeah, not a popular notion here in Ukraine. But I believe, now I understand that people in Moscow watching this movie, they actually thought, well, yeah, this That's guy behaves like some uh, ingush or something. That's very funny. I don't know if they, I'd love to do a study on that. What I find very interesting is that every year in Ukraine, the top rating movie at Christmas or at New Year is Home Alone. And is it not everywhere else? 
Mm, no, no. It's like a very minor movie. But um, really? no, there's like Home Alone is hugely popular here. And I just wondered why. And I think it is like the sort of image of Ukraine. A kid left alone, the adults of the world have abandoned it, has to defend itself with everything against the sort of bandits that have come. So I think Ukrainian self-image is, is Macaulay Culkin in, in Home Alone. <laughs> I believe Ukraine, it has multiple societies. Because, for example, uh, well, I live in my bubble. I, I work in university, in finance, do some consulting. Uh, and I have a specific type of people I deal with. And uh, we all together, we love same music, watch same TV series or something. But then the, there appears another, uh, another layer of people who are also Ukrainians, who are also very pro-independent, but somehow they are very much different in terms of behavior, in terms of consumption, in terms of uh, way of thinking and uh, loving things they actually like. So for example, for me in 2005, in 2004, when we had this first major collision in elections, when part of Ukraine was uh, orange supporting Viktor Yushchenko, part where uh, white and blue supportive uh, of uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Okay, Yanukovych was pro-Russian, but they lived in their own bubble. A bubble of uh, huge factories, a bubble of Russian language, a bubble of building large enterprises. And there was another huge bubble of uh, pro-Western society working more in small medium enterprises, going to Catholic churches, being more religious. West is more religious here. Uh, apparently both of these people were very pro-Ukrainian. Maybe a huge mistake made by Putin. He thought that if people don't support uh, Western uh, way of life, they definitely support the Russian way of life. And now all these layers, um, well, they are mixing all together. And in a way, we are getting to know Ukraine by ourselves. Yeah, I, I'm very intrigued by what Ukrainian or Ukrainian like you means by the term pro-European. Well, right what do you mean by Europe? I'm just fascinated. Because in Britain, we mean something else. That, that, that's yeah. the thing. Because when we say about Britain or Europe or United mm. States of America, we mean what we see in the movies. Freedom of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Freedom of belief. It's mostly about freedom mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a state that does not um, in any way contradict an individual. When you are seeing the Downton Abbey Britain mm -hmm. or Friends TV mm -hmm. series and you actually want to live like, like that. How do you consider um, the Westerners in general, Americans, Britons, Europeans, are they happy with the society they have? So I once worked with an organization that made, uh, they tried to index prosperity because we all knew that GDP purely as a measure of success is very limiting, you know, right. then, then China wins. So, so we were trying to do, or the, the statistics people that I worked with were trying to put together ways of measuring prosperity, go much deeper, things like happiness, satisfaction, access to healthcare, ecology, put them all together, you know. Um, and the hardest one was this happiness thing and satisfaction with the state. The highest satisfaction with the states was where? Uh, Scandinavia. <sighs> Turkmenistan. <laughs> happiness is only in dictatorships because you are happy. Thank you, leader. Normal democracies, people are unhappy. They grouch, they complain. That's a sign of healthiness. So I don't know how we'd measure it this way. I think quite the opposite. No, in, 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 in a lot of Northern European countries, the satisfaction was very low because people have very high demands of the state. And when the state doesn't fulfill its duties, they want more from it. So I don't share a satisfaction with the state and even happiness is a really, really good measure. What are the chances of you managing to create a business, fulfilling yourself? They looked a lot at environment. They looked a lot at quality of life. They looked a lot at um, all those factors. And there was always a tussle between, you know, how important is something like entrepreneurship. And, and it was, yeah, it depended which figures you put in. So if you were slightly less focused on, on entrepreneurship than the Scandinavians Cape Top, if you were slightly more focused on what you're talking about, then it was New Zealand and Switzerland. Being unhappy is good. Being unhappy is a sign of progress. Uh, dictatorship is very suitable for people who don't want to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah, because when you live in a democratic society, you have to be responsible for a lot of things. But when you have Putin, Pinochet, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, well, there is a guy who makes all the decisions for you, or Lukashenko. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, there's this disease that, that, yes, it is, obviously, and that's, that's you know, 
that's many sort of studies of political psychology will, will, will reaffirm that. Why did Britain uh, gave up the idea of uh, torturing neighboring countries? Mm. Yeah. Why did the, the Netherlands, mm. they also, they were an empire. Mm. Even Belgium was one of the most terrible empires in, uh, in Africa. Well, all these countries, they gave up on the colonial ideology and they are integrating into the global society and try to, um, like, you don't need to own the land. Mm. Uh, Politically, if you can buy all the economic actors mm. on this land, right? Mm. So England or the USA, they might not be controlling territories, mm. but they do control the economic activity. And by the way, they do control the, the media activity, mm. as it's mostly also pro-Western val values. Uh, what differs them from um, China and Russia as um, empires? As mm. you said, the, the trauma and humiliation in the past. And what can we do with that? Is there any way to solve this trauma? So, several questions. So cultural trauma, how do you deal with cultural trauma? There is a theory of cultural trauma, which is not the same as psychological trauma. So when we talk about cultural trauma, it's about society's understanding, firstly, confronting the, 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 the reality of the past. So the Holocaust is taken as the biggest example in Europe, both for Jews and for Germans. I mean, we have to remember for 20 years after the Second World War, nobody in Israel or in the Jewish community wanted to talk about the Holocaust. It was just <gasps> too scary. So, so only in the 60s, really, do Jews start talking about it and Europeans start talking about it. You know, there's a taboo on it. So trauma is first seeds coming to terms with the past. Like the Holodomor here, you come to terms with the reality, you find, you establish who's responsible, that's the key thing, who's the victim, who's responsible. You establish that and that allows you to move on. The point of, of cultural trauma is to be able to have a future. When you don't deal with traumas, you're trapped in the past, yeah, because you're constantly coming back to the pain, but you can't resolve it, which is what happens in, in Russia. And it's the same for the perpetrator and the victim. It's a sadomasochistic cycle. Yeah? Um, and that's kind of what Russia wants to do with Ukraine, instead of trying to drag it back into its own trauma, sort of constantly recreating the horrors of the Soviet Union over and over again in this sort of evil postmodern pastiche of a, of a drama with very, very real consequences. While Ukraine wants to burst out into the future, sort of leave it behind. Uh, and Russia says, no, come down, no, come down to the cellar of our, of our traumas. And, and play out these horrible, horrible, sadistic games with us. Um, so, I mean, the way we de dealt with it in, in Britain was not very good, frankly. So, so when I grew up in Britain, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Um, we all knew the empire was bad. Anybody who behaved like they were, spoke like they were from the empire, was laughed at were a figure of fun. So sort of the opposite of Russia. So here you have, ah, oh, he reminds us of, acting Soviet is cool in Russia. That seems like that's a reminder of greatness. In Britain, if you acted as if you were somehow a remnant of the empire and the way you spoke, the way you dressed, you were a figure of fun. So it was a bad thing. All we watched was Gandhi the movie, which clearly said, you know, bad empire, but there were good Britons who helped Gandhi and we identify with the good Britons and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the British are very good at not thinking about the unpleasant past. We all knew it was bad, but we didn't want to talk about it in detail. And secretly, there was always nostalgia for it. And this nostalgia was expressed nostalgia through our empire. love of, through our love of, for the love of greatness. It was expressed through subtle things. You couldn't say it officially. Officially, it was a bad thing. But it was expressed through the cult of country houses. We go to country houses and bathe in the greatness of our past. Now there's a huge controversy in Britain. It's like when you go to these country houses, Downton Abbey style houses, shouldn't there be little books saying where they got their money from? Slavery, mass murder, rape, pillage. And there's this huge scandal like, no, no, we can't, that's, that's woke. No, it's just reality. So- um, British Museum, let's not forget fine. about it. Yes, right? that too. Again, but because that's in the middle of London, there's a lot more consciousness about that being a figure of evil, you know, and that being a, an inheritor of evil and crime, and that's discussed at least, while um, those things aren't. You know, the love of the country house, series like Downton Abbey, all this, this, the love of Jane Austen, well, never mentioning where did everybody in Jane Austen characters get their money from. And Jane Austen characters, the men just appear 
from India with a lot of money. Well, all the books about the empire, because there were novels about the empire, they were thrown out of the school curriculum as being a memory of something we didn't talk about. But firstly, there were horrific wars in the 40s and 50s that we don't talk about. We did not know, in British schools, we did not learn about how we put Kenyans in concentration camps in order to crush their rebellion. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about the Bengal famine. We don't talk about how in the Second World War, Churchill diverted food going to starving Indians to bring to the front, causing a, a famine where I think six million people died. Empire is bad. We definitely, we definitely, we're, we're very proud we got rid of it. It was a bad thing. We don't want to talk about it. We definitely don't want to talk but about its legacy. But at least you stand on this ground that empire is bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm but not saying not, we didn't sell it. It wasn't. It was secretly yearned for. It was a taboo desire. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, Germans they had to pay for the stuff they no. did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they still have this trauma, by mm -hmm. the way. So they are, uh, well, speaking about German scholars, I was very much uh, surprised that they are looking for some German identity. I said, mm -hmm. like, okay, like, well, you have Goethe, you have Wagner, what kind of cultural identity you had? Well, we used to use them as symbols of cultural identity, mm -hmm. and that actually brought to the rise of the Hitler. Mm. Uh, so yeah, now they are very much cautious about it and they, I think they are on the other side of the field in this so, point. So, so, so again, yes and yet no. So I would take a, and, and actually Ukraine is the victim of the bits that they haven't come to terms with. So um, the bits of their past the Germans haven't come to terms with, it's actually connected to the question of collective responsibility. So there's a very famous German TV series, Generation Krieg. Have you heard of it? No. It was 2015 it came out, so the year of the invasion. Um, and it's the big, big budget. All the German stars, all the new German stars are in it. 7 p.m., multi, I think it's the biggest budget for any German TV series. About Generation Krieg, about the generation that went to war in the Second World War. And it's about a group of friends in Berlin, incredibly liberal, have Jewish friends, go to jazz, have these dreams of the future. Then the evil Nazis come. So already this division between good Germans and Nazis. And Nazis are like a parasite. They're the alien force, nothing to do with Germans. There's good, normal Germans, evil Nazis. So already a sort of very strange attitude to the Nazis, something outside of ourselves. So already a pushing away of responsibility. It's the weird thing that came and somehow occupied us. So you start with that. So already you have this thing of like not taking on responsibility, which is one of the big leitmotifs that Germany is still trying to deal with, not very successfully. It's very interesting what happens to that. If you don't take on responsibility, go somewhere else. So most of the films on the Eastern Front, the so these young people who you see at the start of the movie, who are seen as victims of the Nazis rather than part of the society that profited from them and voted for them, go off to fight in the East. And it's very interesting what then happens, how they portray Russia and Ukraine from the point of view of what's happening today and from the point of view of not taking on responsibility. So in this picture of the East, Russians are the kind of the punishment and the conscience that the Germans didn't have. So the Russians are brutish, peasant-like, but deeply spiritual, who come and take on almost a divine retribution against the Germans. Yeah, the, the Germans hurt the Russians, and the Russians are the punishment that the Germans deserve. Yes, they behave like beasts, but romantic beasts. Yeah? So they're the kind of the retribution and the agents of almost divine retribution and the conscience that the Germans need. Yeah? So you don't take on responsibility yourself, you export your conscience onto the Russians and the Ukrainians become the responsibility you refuse to take on. The Ukrainians in the film only appear, and they have Ukrainian bands on, as the collaborators right. who do the Holocaust. So the only time the Ukrainians appear in Generation Krieg is helping the SS take Jewish children. They are so evil that the Germans are appalled by them. So the good Germans are like, oh my God, these Ukrainians are everything that is worse than us. Being unhappy is good. The biggest budget German series in 2015. To make it completely perverse, this is not happening in Lviv, where there were some collaborations. This is happening in Voronezh, in occupied Voronezh, where there are no Ukrainians at all, the middle of Russia, where the collaborationists were Belarusian and Russian. The Germans depict Ukrainians as the agents of all that is worse than the Germans. 
so evil, they're the ones that work with the SS. So it's the SS and the Ukrainians. That is German evil. So the inability to take on responsibility for the Nazis is exported onto the Russians, who are the conscience that we lacked, while the Ukrainians become everything that we hate in ourselves. This is mainstream German TV, 7 p.m., all the big actors, all the German awards, everything, everything, everything. There was a debate about it in Germany. Even some German academics were like, fuck? But not many. And obviously, popular culture is much bigger than a debate in Die Zeit, which is a post-German newspaper. So again, Germany has done amazing things dealing with the past compared to other countries, but it hasn't taken all of its on. And the consequences are being paid for by Ukrainians. I think telling people about the real history of the Second World War is important, but I think it's much more about Germany facing up to the past. The, the, the original problem there was, in the movie, the original problem is the sort of, the lack of taking responsibility for the Nazis, which then leads to, you know, pushing responsibility well, onto others. the Russians. Well, the Russians are also claiming that we are uh, enslaved by Putin, we are prisoners in our own state. Mm. At the same time, when you are reading some bloggers or something, well, I am definitely 100% against war, mm. but, you know, the war will end and we'll have some extra territories like the Crimea and somehow it will settle. Mm. That's a common idea of a Russian liberal. Russians elected Putin several times when there were still competitive elections. Even more importantly, there was definitely a social demand for a dictatorial leader, for a strong hand. That was, Putin was what was created by political spin doctors as a response to what they saw as a desire in society. Putin wins his first elections, which are still competitive elections, on a war in Chechnya, the premise of which is we're gonna destroy civilians and mass murder civilians. That was the point of the war, to show, look how strong I am, I mass murder civilians. People liked that. So, and what, Certainly Russian economic liberals said that they wanted a Pinochet, that we need a dictator. It's a dictatorship now, I don't deny that, and it's been getting more and more dictatorial. But the idea that this came out of nowhere and that this wasn't a constant choice for a long time and a, and a clear demand, I, I mean, just the facts completely, I mean, that's just a lie. The question is what next? When there is no Russia, Yeah. Yeah, there is just a lake of happiness instead of Russia. Okay. Uh, yeah. What do we do next? Uh, these will be small challenges and pleasant challenges compared to the ones that, that we face at the moment. Um, there is a sort of false consciousness in Europe around the reality of the 21st century and, and in America. Um, people are still living on a default late 1990s where everything will be fine as long as we're nice to each other and trade with each other. Nobody wants to think about a world where Russia, China, and other malign actors um, want a world of perpetual conflict and, and sharp power, uh, whether kinetic conflict or non-kinetic conflict. So they haven't woken up. We haven't woken up. Um, we're hiding from reality, and, and you can't really talk about a real future when you're hiding from the present. No one seems to want to understand that, that, that you know, Russia is their enemy too. Right. It's a conflict over there, and obviously we support the little guy a little bit, but you know, if it affects us, then stop fighting, please. That, that is still there, sadly, um, among a lot of elites, in some public opinion as well. That really needs to change, and, and I hope it will. I hope it will over this winter. We'll, we'll see how this winter goes. It could go either way. Yeah, but here in Ukraine, we have hot, the hottest war yeah. there is, yeah. but it keeps on going uh, in Germany, in uh, Britain, I yeah. guess. Right? So there are aspects of uh, this propaganda war, yeah. subsidized by, mostly I guess, by Kremlin. Yeah. But I think there are other players as well. I don't think that Russia is the sole enemy state mm. because the humanitarian Western society is, uh, well, has much more enemies than Russia. Yeah, so there, there's, I mean, the, the big debate is around China. Um, sure. So, so, but again, it's about, it's about um, whether it's Russia or China, it's about recognizing a completely new game. That means changing your business policies, changing your security policies, creating new institutions to deal with this era of, let's call it hyper-competition or whatever. Russia's invasion of Ukraine doesn't fit into economic gain. It's not the cleverest way to do gains in international relations. It's, it really is, seems to be fed by, by a series of, of unresolved, uh, 
um, psychological illnesses, essentially, in, in the political psychology of Russia. Um, so, so China seems to exhibit some of those symptoms. Again, I'm, I'll leave it to China experts to dive into that, but, but certainly the patterns are very, very worrying. And historically, those patterns lead to, to aggression. So that's not a good pattern. They've all been screaming for a long time, just like the Baltic states were, were screaming for a long time. This is not a rational partner. We're not dealing with a normal superpower. We're not just dealing with somebody that has, just has legitimate international relations grievances that can be resolved through diplomacy. We're dealing with something that has at its core very, very, very dangerous instincts and very dangerous drives. Um, and we should listen to them. You know, if the Taiwanese are screaming it, if the Australians are screaming it, if the Vietnamese are concerned, if the Japanese are, are like ringing the bell, then we should listen to them and listen to what could be a very nuanced interpretation, but we should definitely listen to them. We didn't listen to the Baltics for many years. The Baltics were constantly accused, including by the Finns, but definitely by the Western Europeans of being traumatized, of being hysterical about Russia. Or Nazis. The, another point of that, like Russia no, no, likes I mean, to claim everyone to be a yeah, Nazi no one cares. Yeah, I mean, that too, I suppose. But, but, um, but, but that, was, that was the sort of, the, the, those people there, they've been so damaged by Russia, then they're, they're irrational. And for many, many years, the Baltic states were being constantly told by France and Germany of being irrational, we can do a deal with Russia, it's a normal great power state, you little people shut up. The little people were right. And with China, again, we have all these very, very well paid think tanks in DC saying, oh, China's just a rational state that we can do business with, they're just looking for their own seat at the table of international relations and all the stuff that should be resolved. And then you have the countries around and the Chinese dissidents and people in Taiwan and Hong Kong saying, you have no idea what you're up against. So my instinct is to listen to the people who get to face this and listen to them very intently. Is there a way something can change in the evil empires who are just carrying their past behind their back? But there is a process of what we refer to as cultural trauma, coming to terms with the past, taking responsibility, moving on from it. Now, I'm not saying there's some amazing psychological campaign you can do in Russia, which will suddenly get Russians to face up to the past and they just drop their weapons. How can you make a person grow I, up? Yeah, well, I mean, usually it comes after huge defeat and you, and you, you impose it through education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You go, the cost of not owning up was this. Let's do things differently. That's what happens in Germany. You know, it only really starts after the end of the Second World War and Japan. During the Second World War, everyone's just focused on winning the war. You could say that, that what BBC German was trying to do with figures like Thomas Mann, um, who was a German writer who was exiled, they try to keep awake an idea of Germany for the future. Nobody thought it would help win the war, but the idea was that after the war, we've got to have a, a different Germany that we can already articulate. So maybe you can think about how to articulate that. What would a different Russia be? It'd be a Russia that's no longer an empire, where the capital, I think, is no longer in Moscow, by the way, where the Kremlin is a museum, where the mausoleum's gone. Yeah, but let's start where, with the defeat. Yeah, right? well, the defeat has to happen through political and economic warfare and through warfare, and that's about destroying them and beating them and... and, and that's a different set of, that's not about necessarily coming to terms with traumas and taking responsibility. I don't think, you know, I'd love to think that there would be. I don't think that's a great film you can make that will suddenly make, you know. Yeah, what kind of a movie? Uh, yeah, I know, make well, like the that. ones that were made in Germany after, you know, from the 60s, trying to face up to the past. Not like this terrible Generation Krieg, which doesn't face up to the past. But the good ones but that were made. paid for that. The Fassbinder ones, you know, there was a whole wave of new German cinema trying to face up to the past. That, that was its mission. Um, that's exactly what it was trying to do, trying to excavate the past and come to terms with it. So I'd love to, this idea that you have a, a Fassbinder who makes a film about, you know, Russia's lack of a conscience and suddenly Russians watch it and drop their weapons, but I don't think that exists. I don't think there's, I don't think, I don't think however much I believe in, in film and, and the negative and positive power of propaganda, I don't think it works that way. So victories are won through warfare, economic warfare, political warfare. And there's an information component to that to make them more effective. So those are, you know, the old, the old, very hard to measure gains of of, of psychological that operations. That would be and like the top point to finish our interview. But I have one more mm -hmm. question, and it's a bit of a personal one. Okay. And I hope you'll give an honest answer. Okay. No. Would you? <laughs> I'm English. <laughs> would you want to live in Ukraine, in Kiev? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm from here. I was born here, so I know that. so it was very easy for me here. Yeah, yeah, I would, of course. I mean, I kind of try to 
try to spend at least a week a month here anyway. And what are the differences you feel compared to London or USA or anything else? Mm. Well, it's incredibly exciting being part of a project that's being created, of a country that's being created, where everything is in play. Um, firstly, um, secondly, there is a um, um, a kind of everyday cosmopolitanism here, which was very easy for me. Um, which you find in London and, and 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 Washington and New York as well, but but Kiev is part of that as well. But I think it's that it's the excitement of of being part of something that is in the middle of being built, and um, and that's incredibly exciting. Thank you for being with us, Peter. Thank mm -hmm. you for the interview. We had Peter Pomerantsev as our guest, and we spoke about uh, we spoke about uh, fucking everything, uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. About the empires, about the cultural traumas, and about the way we are heading towards. So, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. It was okay. um, wide-ranging and stimulating.